Mike Mixtape here, and welcome to Cinema Talk, where I talk to online personalities about their personal lives, and we go deep down into their psyche about movies. Mm. <laughs> and yes, yes, yes. Uh, today, mm. today's guest is very special because he's a he's a really good producer. He's uh, Joey T- Tedesco of Cartoon Palooza. Thanks for coming on by. Ooh, you buttering me up already. You're telling me how great I am and all. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. No problem, man. So uh, uh, this is how it's going to go. I'm going to go, you know, to the past and kind of work our way up to the present. So go casually, you know, just relaxing conversation between us. So oh, yeah. the first question I always ask in my interviews is that when it comes to the movies, animation or TV shows, what is the earliest memory you can think of when it comes to that? You know, I had time to think about this one for a bit. And for me, um, the two stories come to mind. Uh, the first story is the earliest memory that I have. But believe it or not, uh, the second one is one that, you know, my parents tell me. But uh, the first one, it really comes down to my love for movies. Um, I'm the blockbuster generation, so when I had to go look for a movie, I was the one who had to, you know, go with my dad, find the good, best movie to look at. You know, it was everything, you know, movie for him, movie for me. And I'm like five years old, too, so I'm looking in the R-rated section I'm, and horror movies, anything, just to get an idea of what was going on. Uh, okay. So, like, I'm looking on the backs of the boxes, reading them out to my dad, and a couple of those uh, uh, conversations, you know, other parents are just sort of looking at me like, um, he's reading them back to uh, Halloween. Uh, do you think this kid gets what this movie is about? <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> There I am, just sort of like reading the backs of these boxes, and you know, the cover arts are amazing, and I'm watching these movies too, but under like right supervision, super guidance. I mean, that whole idea, like when it comes to like how old you are and how old you need to be when um, when watching certain movies, really depends on the context. And I, I pretty much came from a lax household, so generally, when it comes to um, what we watch and how it affects our lives, really depends on the context. And for me, I felt like we had a pretty pretty sturdy upbringing going on so but generally the that, that, that's not even the best part the best part is when uh we took out the godfather and we we're bringing it back to uh it had to be the godfather bringing it back to blockbuster and i'm the one going in returning it to the guy i didn't go into the slot i went in and i gave it to the guy on the counter and i said leave the gun take the cannolis pass up the box I had the whole store cracking up. <laughs> great story to put, great, great story for uh, family get-togethers, that's for sure. They always go back to that one. But the one that I don't even remember, but one that, like, my mom tells me about, and I, I get a kick out of hearing it because I don't even remember having this conversation. I'm, like, seven years old, and I'm getting into the Academy Awards. This is probably the first year I was, like, seven, and... Uh, Titanic was the big movie that year. Uh. Parents wanted me to see that movie too, and you know, I was really into the Academy Awards. Even around seven years old, uh, I was looking up at these um, at the nominees, and an electrician comes over, and he just at some point he um, was talking talking about Titanic, which then caused me to jump into the conversation, and then twenty minutes later he tells my mom. Um, your kid, I kind of want to bring him to like a like a betting pool because I think he's got the right idea for who's going to win these awards. <laughs> God knows why they would ever remember that. Truth be told, I'm probably no good at that today only because my predictions are not how it turns out to be. But regardless of that, I think it's great because it just shows that based on my upbringing, very laxed, but there was... You know, if you're ever into film or you're into, ever into movies, it was encouraged. Look into it. Try it out for yourself. So I kind of, I really did appreciate that aspect of it as far as films. And a lot of it also came back to another side story is when learning how to read, uh, my parents wouldn't just read the books to me growing up. They would have the children's book and they would give side characters in the illustrations their own characters and do like observational <laughs> observational comedy so like say there's like one picture of like a mom 
leaving and talking to you know talking to the father while the kid is playing on like, I don't know DW Arthur playing and the parents are in the side or something not part of it but still you know in the background illustration my parents would act out like you know a silly argument they have <laughs> wow. I know it seems less, it seems superfluous but you know <laughs> it really affected me because you know everything matters it's you know the little details in the background uh, little cues and and a little bit of comedy too just uh, experimenting trying new stuff out some of them didn't land obviously but it was a nice experience for me to go off of when sort of developing my own thing hmm that's really interesting that's cool really cool um so okay what is the movie that got you into cinema in general? Like, you wanted to look the behind the scenes, you listen to the commentary, you know, all the details, ah, how it was made. Yeah, so it's not even a good movie. Prepare yourselves. <laughs> oh, boy. I don't know if you remember this. I don't know if you remember this from my reviews, but a couple of videos before. I um, love Looney Tunes. Uh-huh. And the movie for me to really do this was uh, Space Jam. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, Space Jam with Michael Jordan, the cinematic yeah. uh, masterpiece with uh, Michael Jordan and Bugs Bunny. <laughs> oh yeah, man. The longest, uh, longest Nike commercial ever. It was the movie to really do it for me. But oh, um, wow. a lot of it, a lot of it had to do with the experience, and I think a lot of it. Uh, right now, I, I'm studying counseling, and I'm studying psychology, counseling psychology, and we go through like developmental stages and whatnot. And at a certain age. Um, I think it was Erickson who said that kids perceive uh, things differently. Imagina- imaginary play is really highlighted at around – I might be wrong. Someone in the comment section is going to be like, uh, I'm, I'm a professional. I know what Erickson's all about. <laughs> so I'm willing to have him correct it for me. But at a certain point, uh, imaginary play is hard to distinguish from real life, and it's perfectly normal for some kids to have that. So my first time seeing Space Jam, I didn't grow up with Roger Rabbit. This was like my first time seeing cartoons with live action. And give the movie any credit you want. The animation and the live action blending is done fantastically. Mm-hmm. Like that's probably the, the biggest strength of that movie. And for a kid like me, in that sort of stage in life, it's just sort of like, how, 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 does, this, how does this work? Like even like you know back then you know you read up about movies you get a camera you shoot with a camera I was like okay now how do you get Bugs Bunny in there and then when every parents are explaining it's a green screen thing so you're gonna be standing in front of a green screen and then they're gonna draw it in post that stuff didn't comprehend to me that stuff didn't didn't really stick to me it was the uh, how do you get that point A to point Z B and in B and Y were not necessary and that to me was like it was amazing because like I wanted to. I, I, it started like a little bit of imaginary play, and then it got me to check out the uh, Art of Space Jam book, which <laughs> God knows why my mom figured that out, but she got me the Art of Space Jam. So like I was flipping through this book, I was looking at the concept art, different things that didn't make it into the movie, and to be honest with you, I actually appreciated the book a little bit more than I did the actual movie. Of course. But for me... It got me thinking about the actual technicality of filmmaking and uh, part of – I want to say like part of why I love cartoons and I love animation. But it was right. one of those things to just sort of say this could be an interesting thing to, to get into. And I mean I just started to, to doodle more. I started to watch more cartoons around the time, experience different things, different cartoons, have my Mickey Mouse phase, go through my Bugs Bunny phase, go through a very brief uh, Pokemon phase. Of a Batman course. and uh, Bruce Tim phase, you know it. Mm-hmm. I pro I probably dabbled in it all back then, and even now, no judgment there. <laughs> uh, but for me, yeah, Space Jam was the uh, the cinematic masterpiece to really do it for me to to really get me into checking this out. God dang, yeah, I remember that. Ah, oh, that was good times. I was. That was 1996. I was probably six years old when that came out. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. Good memories with that. The first thing I remember when that movie came out was the posters. I don't know if you, it was like an Art Deco style where it was like red on black. Like, oh, yeah, red on black where you'd have like the characters in silhouette with Michael Jordan and then like a Tweety Bird. I was like, wow, that's a really cool looking poster. And then I see the trailer for it. I was like, OK, that's cool. OK. 
story looks dumb, but how are they doing this? I want to know, damn it. Um, I must know. Tell me, uh, tell me what do you do? <laughs> What's in the bag? <laughs> oh god. Um, that's me. That's me. That's me to the director. What's in the box? What's in, What's the, in the box? What's in the box? <laughs> What's in the box? Dun, 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 dun. Uh, so there's tons and tons of movies out there, and it, I really, it's hard for me to say this, but there is no perfect movie. But to some people, there might be a movie that's like the best, the best, and it's just oh, perfect yeah. when it comes to you know the editing, the acting, you know all the elements of you know film. So what is a movie that you think is just has all the elements that make it so good, best, and amazing? Hey man, as anybody knows, when they're going into film criticism, defending a movie and justifying why it is the best of the best is difficult because this isn't a science we're walking into. It's walking into the right side, mm -hmm. a little bit of subjective and whatnot. We've all had that experience, and you know, either way you look at it, someone's gonna tell you you're wrong. But for this movie, I don't really care. And even though it is a well-regarded movie, um, I just a general when it comes to film criticism, you're always gonna have someone disagree with you but you know the personal aspect is what makes the criticism worth it how is the critic emotionally swayed enough as well as to evaluate what is really good about it and what isn't and really what it comes down to is martin scorsese's raging bull for uh. me yeah um a great movie is one that allows you to explore every emotion and for me watching raging bull was everything was pretty much the uh the smorgasbord of emotions. You got scared. You got angry. You got, you know, you got a little into the romance, but then you, you know, you freaked out. And then you're cheering. And then you're laughing at some points, you know, and you know, Pesci and, and De Niro are having their banters. And then you, you're just sort of like looking at this whole experience this, of this guy. And it's weird because uh, it's not just Raging Bull, but I think movies that deal with life experiences, characters that have to grow up characters that have to start and learn something the coming of age stories to me is great cinema that's why my second favorite say second favorite movie which is also my favorite animated film is bambi because oh. it's all about the experience it's about the characters growing up you know okay and i mean we we, we could testify for the editing thelma shoemaker is is one of the best editors in the business um the cinematography was on par especially when it comes to black and white because you know anybody who's gone into filmmaking knows that you know color grading in digital films can be hit or miss even you know films are hard when you got to get the lighting down but for black and white cinematography it's always the best middle ground for everybody to get into and i highly recommend that anybody who wants to get into filmmaker at least dabble in black and white imagery and even though like we associate black and white to tim burton or dark and and depressing and gloomy it's a style choice that it is style choice when used right it can tell a really great story and a lot of that also had to do i think at least when uh raging bull was being made was to reflect the time period it was coming out but also to um work with budgets you know right it did look really good but there was a lot of things like smoke and and lighting that would have done that would have done terribly i mean to to justify for this they've got some shitty uh jake lamada movie coming out soon that oh, they're yeah. trying to pull off. Yep, they're uh, trying to pull that off as the new, uh, the new Raging Bull, new and improved, or uh, mm. as I like to call, new and improved in the DVD bin, uh, five dollar <laughs> bin at uh, Fye. Hopefully, those are still around. <laughs> I I still haven't seen Raging Bull. It's Martin Scorsese is that director that I've seen a few films of. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, that's one of the films I want to see because that came out like in 1980, I believe, and I'm a big 80s fan, so I got to get into that, man. Um, the funny thing about it, too, like the real sell for me wasn't even like finding out. And th to me, this is how this is the best way I find out about movies. It's not through streaming. Like I mentioned, I'm the blockbuster generation. Right. The best way for me to watch movies is when I actually go to a store and I, I search for it. Oh. Because when you're actually – you know, evaluating what you have in front of you versus I, 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 I can't get into it. I have a Netflix account. And I do watch whatever's there, but because it's all out there and it's just, it gives you, you can choose whatever you want. It's all there as much as you can. 
uh, there's no value to, as much as actually sorting through the movie and actually t- taking a moment to decide by looking through this selection, this library in front of you, physical library, uh, what to actually evaluate and what to choose. I feel like that was, um, at least for me, that's important when it comes to deciding what movies. And that's how I found Reaching Bull. I didn't think much about it. I didn't even think about it as being the Scorsese movie. I was like, I love De Niro, and uh, let's see where this goes. And I find out, you know, when you're so interested in a movie, you find out about what you love about the film, but you also find out a little bit about its background. And uh, for for Scorsese, this is the film to like get him out of a get him out of a coke addiction. Right. Like it was a big one for him. Yeah, it was. It was basically like his redemption story. Granted, the Academy didn't recognize that for best director, you know, over what was it, Ordinary People, with uh, Robert Redford, because we all know that movie, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sure. Right. <laughs> Sure, sure. Like I said, if you got me in for a pool for the for award nominations, I will. Uh, you're better off looking at the next guy in your office or something because it won't be me. <laughs> no, if I mean I could be the same way too because I'm not good with those either. <laughs> right. Oh man. Because the movies that are good do not get it. Exactly. It's the the Academy is just oh my god, just you know it just it's. It's all politics. It's politics, I tell you, politics. Ah. Politics. Um, can't stand it but uh, like i said uh, raging bull was that movie to really really capture everything on an emotional level and for me it's the best movie ever just physically and emotionally impacting and it can be a hard pill to swallow for some people it cannot be everybody's thing exactly but i do think you know it is the movie that if i had to like be on a desert island i would have that Mm. i'd also have you know a dinner you know in a boat so i could leave that island but you know of course oh, dvd player to so i could watch the movie so yeah exactly would that be the film yeah um i'm the same way like the the movie that got me was actually a physical media form where i went to the store and i actually looked at the cover of it and i was like what is this movie and i was curious about it and i ended up buying it and going home with it and i enjoyed it and that movie was back to the future wow i was young wow I I, re- good. I remember like I remember like it was 2002. I was 12 years old. I went to the store. I saw the blue DVD box. It was it was the it was blue with Marty and Doc on the cover. I was like, what is this movie? I gotta see this. Bought it. It was the whole trilogy. Took it home. Watched it as a kid. I love Back to the Future to this day. It's just I just it's so amazing. <laughs> One of my favorites. You know. I agree with you, and this actually goes back to a video I did recently uh, about a month ago. You know, the way we start developing our own taste is when we get to choose for ourselves. Exactly. When we grow up, we don't really, yeah, we really don't get that choice. Your mom, mom or pop goes and finds uh, Kung Fu Panda, <laughs> but it turns out being the video Briquedo version, you know, <laughs> Kung Fu uh, Ninja, Ninja Chop Suey. Uh, bird, <laughs> but it looks like DreamWorks, so I guess it'll pass. You know, once we're liberated and we're free, and we can realize that's not it. You know that that that's important. Yes, it is. I just hate, totally. I just hate when those like, like grandmas getting a movie for their grandsons. Like, ah, there's Transformers, but let me get oh Transmorphers. That's a good movie for my kid. <laughs> It's funny too because like an early memory to go back to early memories. Uh, yep. The one the one movie to ever do that, and they, I don't think they ever made this mistake ever again. But I think it was an intentional choice. As much as they give my parents and my family upbringing for being very you know liberated and and sort of progressive, you know it was still a Catholic household. Right. And the movie that we all wanted to see was Hunchback in Notre Dame. So right. we went to go see that movie, and <laughs> my parents kind of hated it. Oh. They did think it was kind of like putting shade on the Catholic Church. Uh, so when the movie came out on the, on video, they wanted to get the, the other Hunchback of Notre Dame by, like, I think it was the same studio that did Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, Good Times, the, uh, uh, the knockoff of it. So, yeah. Okay. Well, speaking of uh, something that's probably on the shitty side, um, what is the worst movie you've ever seen? Like, the, the, the big biggest piece of shit in the world oh oh <laughs> i don't I th- even have to think about it to I, be honest with you because I've, I've been vocal about it ever since so well, let's go back to that video i made a while ago oh, so geez. in case you guys want to check out a little bit of uh you know self-promotion yep. clink, clink. i did a vlog 
on when do we decide when movies are bad. Mm -hmm. And you know, we grow up and we make that decision for ourselves and we start developing our own taste at a certain point. I was in the seventh grade and around that time I was understanding a little bit about myself. I was getting into filmmaking. I did a video editing class. I also was getting into art. I was exploring different mediums in the middle in middle school. And for me, the big illustrator, the guy I wanted to be like, was Dr. Seuss. He was the cartoonist oh. illustrator and the illustrator's cartoonist. He has form, he has, you know, clever storytelling within forty pages. You know, give him a give him a list of words and he'll make a story out of it. He was the guy. Like I really looked up to that. I still look up to that in some ways. So around that time, the cat in the hat came out. But here's the thing, man. Here's the thing. I didn't hate the Grinch. I thought that movie was okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, people can say it had issues, and they tried to do certain things, and they, they were trying to like reinvent the wheel. Ron Howard was trying to do his own adaptation that didn't take away too much from the book, and you know, from the from the Chuck Jones short. Right. But at the same time, it's not perfect. But you can't you you, you watch this movie and you ask why. You that's all I was doing when watching this movie. Us outside of just a cringe fest of just. Uh, of hating every moment of it. It was like, why did this movie get made? What was the point of, of putting this out there? Was it for the exposure? So if it's about the exposure, why not show them the good qualities of the book when they can't even get that part right? Why why are the, the set design, why is the choice like this? Why is the color skills like that? Like why, why are they saying this shit? Excuse my language. Uh, why are they saying this crap, man? Like, it's a PG movie, and I understand you can put in some subversive humor for for the kids and whatnot. But it was it was bordering on you know traditional Austin Powers humor in a kids movie. It just it made no sense. And the only reason I did see this movie was because I was babysitting my sister and her friend, and the mom was there too. And she said, "You want to come with us?" And I said, "Sure, let me do it." I was I I've never felt so bad for a movie I didn't have to pay for. I hated I, the experience alone made me feel like I wanted a refund, even though I didn't pay for anything. It was horrible. God. Oh my God, yeah. But for me, that was the worst of the worst because it really, it showed, it kind of opened me up to the idea of what film criticism is. And I actually found myself getting into criticism and, and reviewing after that movie because the first thing I did, I was like, I can't be the only one asking all these questions there's got to be professionals doing this too and i go to movies.com i go to i didn't go to rotten tomatoes i go to movies.com they got a great uh compile of, of people that review the movies ah, okay. and <laughs> all negative all negative and they're all asking the same things i'm saying and i was like okay so i'm not the only one i it isn't a gang mentality i was just like i feel like i feel like i'm, I'm part of this it's good it's like group therapy reading all this <laughs> yes. all this stuff Yes, yeah. Most people, <gasps> most people would just say get, just talking about it, man. <laughs> what most, was that? Most people would say like, "Oh, the worst of the worst is probably the room." <laughs> yeah, but you gotta give the guy credit. He knew like what his limitations were, and he just kind of had fun with it. <laughs> but at the same time, this is a a hundred million dollar movie that pe that investors had to say approve. They had to approve on jokes like "dirty hole," or they had to approve on. Uh, on uh, the cat in the hat getting kicked in the nuts, or you know, Alec Baldwin getting off on uh, on soft porn. People, investors, producers had to say yes and give a hundred million dollars to the filmmakers to make it happen. And that's the worst crime of all. Oh yeah, I totally agree. Uh, Not an oversight. That was like you know they would have known what they're getting themselves into, man. They would have known. How did it get past the censors for crying out loud? <laughs> How and you know I, I I people mentioned that in filmmaking and, and and if you make a joke that offends they'll always send in a second reel that will sometimes maybe offend more or, or counter it and maybe that's what happened but it just uh, ugh. next question okay um, so <laughs> so okay so how did you get into like making videos and posting them online that's actually another great story I think I'm I'm probably Having so many great stories, I had to think about for a bit. But uh, <laughs> that's good. That's good. A little, a little, a little self, uh, 
a little bit of ego there. I apologize. <laughs> just, just stroke it, man. Just stroke that ego. I'll stroke. I'm stroking that ego right now. I was in the, uh, like I mentioned before, my love for acting came from you know, me, my family, acting out movie scenes, and uh, you know the whole growing up with story storybooks and giving the other, you know, making the stories more than what they were on page. Uh, that kind of followed me into you know middle school, which was as most people can attest for, the most awkward phase in any boy or girl's life. Because uh, bodies growing up, um, things that make sense don't make sense anymore. And the sixth grade was a miserable, horrible year for me. Um, I was also the new kid to put it on. The, I was Riley. Let's just put it that. I was Riley from Inside Out. And I just felt like I could not get along with anything. And then, you know, the seventh grade comes along and acting. I can do acting. I could do plays, and I'm trying out for different plays, and I'm getting these roles. Around the time that I'm getting an expander in my mouth, so I suddenly get a lisp as soon as I get this role, and the director's like, come on, get over it. <laughs> but anyways, it was still fun. I was getting lead roles and stuff. You know, I was doing acting. It, it, we'll get into high school as well, but then I was also doing video editing. It's funny that I always go back to the seventh grade, but I feel like that was kind of like the nexus of, like, where I wanted to go creatively and even, you know, Mentally, because I feel like, you know, the experiences I had in middle school, um, you know, I want to say I got picked on a lot, but I was different. And I felt like I was pointed out for that a lot. So in some ways, it kind of affected where I went and why I wanted to explore myself a little bit more. And uh, a lot of growing up fast. What, you, what not? But filmmaking came in. <laughs> Short answer, I, t I was able to take the filmmaking class. And I was able to... Um, experiment, uh, learn about techniques, use a camera, make uh, edit on a Adobe Premiere, and be able to use different editing softwares that go from Adobe Premiere and, and what was known as the Casablanca, which <laughs> you actually had to put in VHS mm -hmm. to, uh, to use that to export out, and then if you ever wanted to put it on a DVD, you would have to take that VHS and, exp and uh, put it onto a DVD versus, you know, Adobe Premiere. Just burn it on a DVD <laughs> or save it as a save it as a file because around that time, even though YouTube was out, nobody was really sharing files online or really knew how to share files online. The idea was there and the technology was there, but the streaming capabilities weren't the same. Right. And they didn't get improved until like, I want to say, for me, it would have been, I want to say like 2007 was when video, maybe 2006. Even though it came out in 2005, streaming started to become more popular, and it was easier to, to view the file around that time. And I think that's when I found myself not exporting to video to share videos with you know professors and whatnot, but right. share, sharing it as a digital file. Uh -huh. Now, why I wanted to go into YouTube, why I wanted to go into Blip or whatever streaming site ever... Mm -hmm. was because it was liberating. It was fascinating. I didn't have to uh, worry about oversight or anything. I didn't have to worry about um, what other people would think. It was really just my own thing. And um, the funny thing about that, too, though, is what was I going to do? Comedy sketches. I thought I would do comedy sketches with my friends. And a lot of the friends I've made in high school, we would do comedy sketches. They're like, all right, let's just tr put it onto video and uh, make uh, comedy sketches online. That didn't really work out because I had to like work with everybody's schedules. But then, then on one faithful day, I watched a review for Meet the Spartans from the Spill Crew. Oh, okay. That was awesome. Uh -huh. <laughs> you had two guys who watched this really shitty movie and just... The animated characters, too, not even, like, great, you know, excellent animation, just really great banter, mm -hmm. simple animation, and it looked awesome. And I was like, wow, I kind of I kind of want to do that because it doesn't seem as as imposing as uh, having to get people together. And even though that was still an aspect of the Spill crew, and even today when they're double-toasted, or at least a couple that went on to doubletoasted.com, right. um, it was still a... Uh, it was kind of cool to see guys just shoot the shit, talk movies, crack jokes here and there, utilize video editing, do most of the jokes in post. And I was like, I want to do that. And I don't even want to like take it on seriously, but I still want to, I still want to take a part in that. And I guess 
going on out of high school and into college, I started to notice that Spill.com was very big, kind of bigger online and the internet than it was on YouTube. Right. And even though I said that there was this sort of simplicity to it, it was still kind of complicated as far as like, because they were, they were actually legit crit- critics. They were going to uh, press junkets. They were talking to filmmakers. They had to do a lot of stuff that I don't have the capabilities of doing. Right. I mean, I'm getting my mas- I'm getting my bachelor's in psychology. I mean, that was that was my my drive. That's my that's my career. I kind of just want to do something on the side, and it seemed like they were doing this legit. But then it was this yeah, around that time I discovered uh, Doug Walker and uh, and Nostalgia Critic. Around that point, it seemed like they had it down to a better formula to utilize than what. Uh, that what Spill.com was doing, it made it seem very complicated. Um, there was a simplicity to Doug Walker's videos, and even today, compared to most other filmmakers, there is a simplicity to it that I really appreciated. There's obviously it is complicated in some aspects, but guy standing in front of a camera, uh, jokes in post, <laughs> boom, there's your video. And to me, I was like, I really want, I, I really want to do that because I love talking about movies. People tell me I'm good at talking about movies. Let me do that too. And the animation really came down to, as I mentioned before, my love for art. So as much as I love uh, making the movies, I also love drawing. I love to paint. I love uh, graphic novels. I'm, you know, I don't even need a background uh, taking classes or a degree in digital media for me to get jobs as a d- graphic designer. I'm able to do that for people just by knowing it. <laughs> so hey, hint hint. If anybody wants uh Wants to hire a graphic designer? We'll talk rates. <laughs> He's here for hire. There you go. There you go. But, like, I don't know. I think when it comes to why I wanted to, to do it, it, it did take me a lot of pre-planning. I had to um, figure out what it was I wanted to do, what I was going to be talking about. And for me, the animation, I, was, I pretty much chose because I love the art of it. Um, I love the actual process. And I loved uh, all the incorporations of creating a world from the ground up. And yes, you're going to have really shitty animated movies that don't do it right. It's worth calling calling out for that in some aspects. Mm-hmm. But I'm not like the kind of person that's that would like to belabor. Even like my most harsh videos. I think I've probably gotten a little bit harsher now. But I think I try to at least justify why I hate something versus just blindly saying this sucks. And for me, it can be very imposing, especially for you know a video editor to say, I, I pretty much said everything I had to say, but then someone say, like, well, you were just unnecessarily cruel. And it's like, well, I don't know. I felt like I kind of justified it. It's worth hearing out why it was it sounded unnecessarily cruel, but, but why not? I feel like, you know, if you're going to say something, don't just say it to be angry. I mean, don't just say for the character. At least have a reason as to why you hate it. And I think that kind of just stuck with me when I was doing this. I was like, I hate something, but why do I hate it? And I have to draw from, like, personal experience. I got to draw from, like, the questions I ask myself. Like, I kind of ask myself for the, for the cat in the hat. And the same thing applies for cartoons that I love. Because it's weird. Because around this time, when I'm doing videos um, early on, I noticed that there was a popular way to doing it. And I think, you know, it was double-edged sword. As, as easy as it was for Doug Walker to make these videos, it created a formula that most people tried to utilize and kind of just, in my opinion, kind of cash off of at times. People were making 20-minute videos, making 40-minute reviews, making, you know, a minute and a 30 uh, hour and 30-minute reviews of, of, uh, of one single movie, and uh, they, it was just like a video essay form. You know, it was basically just writing out an essay and then uh, not really doing any, doing that much great editing to it as well. It was very imposing. And, you know, it was like, I don't want to do that. What do I love about Spill? It's a short video. It's five minutes long. It'd be 10 minutes at the longest. So for me, when I was making my videos, I was like, let me just uh, keep it short, simple to the point, but not too short where people don't know what I'm talking about. And that's kind of like just stuck with me when I created like a show Bible for myself. I was like, so if I'm going to be making these videos, I don't want to go into 20 minutes. If I do, it's going to be a vlog. If I do, it's going to be, you know, a stream or something or whatnot. Even though I haven't ever streamed, actually. (laughs) Um, I'm not going to do long videos. Don't expect me to be uh, 
a two hour long guy. I'm a short, simple to the point. And do not say that's what she said, because then I will have to find you and uh, hunt you down. <laughs> uh, so I hope that answers your question. That that's really insightful, actually. It's really really Thanks. insightful. Um, so I mean, did you ever notice that too? Like, you know, when you when you got into it, there were just some things that people were 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 jumping on the bandwagon. Yeah. And for me, I'm not trying to like offend anybody and I, I really don't because there are people great video filmmakers who utilize this term but mm -hmm. i this is where you're gonna hear it folks i hate the word review averse i yeah. hate it so much yeah i kind of i remember that whole era i don't it like became that an either. era and i don't like it because like i said that that formula was being born out of it and there were good people that were utilizing mm -hmm. it but then you had copycats and you had i, I hate to say copycats because you had people that were just blindly doing the same thing without any trying to do a deviation off of it. Exactly. You know? And that was the problem that came with the word and what what, what seemed like a liberating thing. It's like, oh, review averse. It's basically the thing that connects all the people together. All the people on one website, on one forum. Not uh, you know, the spill.com community, not the uh, the Jeremy Johns community, just the the Tig with Tig community. Exactly. And that's what was very Exactly. That was, that was very imposing about it, and I couldn't stand it at all. And I still can't stand it. There was a video I had to make where someone wanted me to use that word, and I think I'll, I'll talk more about that later in regards to um, when it comes up in the podcast. But anyways, I went off my little spiel there. Let's, no, no. let's move on. It's fine, <laughs> Joey. It's more, okay. it's, you're good. Dude, it's, rambling is fine. Rambling is success, accessible here. Um, okay. So... So, all right, going down that line a little bit more, how did you get associated with um, Mr. Coat and Friends? That's a, I may as well actually start with, um, I guess that kind of goes with the last question too, because when I'm going into this, I didn't want to do it blindly. I had to figure out who it was <clears throat> who would actually watch my videos. So if I was going to share to somebody, I was going to share it with people that were doing something similar. That's when I started to share on similar sites, I was sharing direct messages. This is the one thing I couldn't stand about Blip, is that you could not send a direct video uh, to the person. Uh, with YouTube, you can do that. And I think you could still do that, kind of. It's kind of changed, but I think there was more flexibility with YouTube when it comes to sharing and letting, sharing out, you could actually friend somebody. And um, it felt, I felt like YouTube utilized that a little bit better, especially around then. Yeah. But for me, it pretty much started with that. I was sharing my videos, and a couple of the guys. <laughs> I wish I could make a great story out of this, but I, I guess I can't. But uh, you know, I was on the forum, and they noticed my stuff. They wanted to know if I wanted to, um, you know, Stefan wanted to know if I wanted to uh, post on his site, and I said, yeah, totally, because like you got Matt Brunet, you got all these guys doing this stuff, and I was like, I'd love to be part of that. We all have, all have a common interest. That was another thing too, is that Mr. Coat. Is primarily animation reviews. I mean, they do other stuff, they right. do video games, and they do that, but it has its audience rooted in animation and a love for animation. And I wanted to be a part of that because that's what I do. Yeah. Yeah. That's... I really wish I could make that one a good story, but yeah. that was pretty much just who you know and just constantly doing something you love to do and being a little bit persistent. At some point, someone's going to take notice and uh, you look into it, and then you go from there. It seems about right, because I did ask the same question to both James, Morgan, and Matt, and they said about the same thing, so. Yeah, I know. It's it's weird, because, like, you know, you wish you could be like, well, one day we were, you know, hunting dragons, and uh, I met up with uh, Stefan, who, uh, you know, he, he got the gizzard, and I was cutting the tail off. Oh, by the way, I post on the site. You want to join me? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> we'll say we'll say that's how I jumped on the site. We'll, we'll go with that story. <laughs> you heard it, everybody. Stefan and Joey T., Dragon Hunters. Sounds like a movie now. Dragon Hunters. Coming soon. <laughs> Coming soon. <laughs> um, uh, so, what is your favorite video that you've made over the years? Oh, uh, man. You know, when you start off, you're kind of blind to, like, problems you have because you're just so happy that you've made a video. Because, like, some people can't get themselves off the idea phase. And, you know, I've had a lot of people, you know, tell me, I've got this idea, I got this thing I want to do, and I want to know how to do it. And, you know, it's like, just do it. 
But then after I did it, I was very happy with what turned out. And it's funny because like as you get older and older and you're doing this much longer, believe it or not, six years of making these video reviews, you become more jaded. You become uh, some things that people notice, you know, get to you. Sometimes you notice that you should be making more videos based on more views based on the what's my call it the uh, the rate you have, and then suddenly to hit a peak, you're like, wait, am I peaking? What am I doing different? Suddenly you become more self conscious, and suddenly you're you're becoming like you know thinking, oh my god, oh my god, what am I doing wrong? And uh, <clears throat> at some point, I kind of just let go, and I'm just doing my own thing while being consistent to a schedule. But the thing is, if I had to choose the videos that I was most happy with, I mean, I was going to say it was my crossover with um, with uh, DJ Soundbite for um, Event Sevenfold's A Little Piece of Heaven. Uh-huh. I was very happy with the way that video turned out. But truth be told, I was actually really happy when I first started and I made the first three videos. And I, there were problems with those videos. I, uh, there was rendering issues. I mean, you see black bars. You see the green, green strips that tells you you didn't render the footage well. You didn't get the right mm-hmm. video format. When I actually edited Shark Tale, I didn't realize that when I was ripping the movie, I had to do it to a readable format for uh, Premiere to recognize. And it would actually cause the audio to out-sync with the, uh, the video. So and all I had to do was just changing the tag or like reconverting it. I didn't know that. So part of why the video was supposed to be like uh, 10 minutes long ended up being ended up being six or seven. Mm. So like and I felt like hmm, I like this because it goes back to the whole spill dot com thing. I was like, you know what? Short and simple, short and to the point. And I get all my points across. I'm basically just going to do it like that. And then when Beetlejuice came out, I did the same thing, too. I had a, a nice little sketch in the beginning. I don't do too many sketches. I don't want to be too overwhelming because, like, I work with my limitations. I work with what I can do. And to me, it's like, all right, I want to do this, but can I do this? So that's really what comes into play. And the Beetlejuice allowed me to do that. I was like, I was able to do something by myself. I knew the camera I was working with. I knew, like, you know, how much space I had, um, where I was going to keep the, the camera's uh, position. And I was like, I know what I can do to get it done. And I was very happy with the way that turned out. But truth be told, <laughs> truth be told, the video that I loved making the most, and I'm noticing this was the video to really kind of like jump me forward from those first three was The Return of Jafar. Mm. Now, granted, I was kind of cruel on that movie, but, mm. you know, there was a lot of personal hatred towards it. There was you know, also, like I mentioned before, an understanding of what I was doing. It was three videos in and I realized I, I think I know what I want to do when I'm doing this. It helped me find my voice. And I was very happy with the way that turned out. And I noticed more people were, were watching at that point. I mean, it's probably not my most viewed video right now, but if I ever you know, feel down or if I ever feel like, what did I need to do differently? I go back to that video because that video was also the one that other reviewers were noticing and wanted to get out to me. We're like, yo, we, we think you might want to you know, check out these people. And, you know, this site's defunct now. It's called webcinema.com. We still hang out, whatnot. But um, it was how I met them. It was how I uh, got to work with them. And uh, pretty much learned something. Learned something new. Sweet. Um, Return to Jafar, everybody. My favorite. Return to Jafar. Everything else, every other review, shit. (laughs) (laughs) I put less effort into it now. I don't give a damn anymore. Suffer. (laughs) um so let's 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 talk about the uh the crossover between you and matt oh yeah because that one i was like people were excited for that like when you guys were teasing about that and then all of a sudden when it came out people Mm -hmm. just went ballistic so uh how how did you like come together and plan this whole thing i mean i i know you guys we're in a video together about Sony animation, the whole Matt with the dark side and you That's torturing, right. torturing him. That's like my, uh, my girlfriend and I quote that a lot, that the whole dark side, come to the dark side of the forest. Like, <laughs> no, <laughs> it's so hilarious. It's the best part. Oh, so man, thank you. Yeah, that, That's actually very flattering. Thank you. Yeah. So, so how did you like end up doing the Smurfs crossover with Matt? Well, we got to go start from the beginning because, truth be told, um, I was always friends with Matt uh, after we joined the site. But mm-hmm. even before then, I uh, I didn't get why he was not into Sony Animation. Right. I watched his Hotel Transylvania review, and I was like, 
I like what he does, but I don't. I'm not agree. I'm I'm noticing something was off with the way he was talking about uh, Sony Animation. I was like, he has reasons, but I don't I don't get it because like everything he says is wrong. I feel like can be justified with uh, with something else. So like that's when I just started to make a Sony Pictures Animations, and then people were very conscious about the fact that there was another animation critic on the site who hated this studio that I was praising in my Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs review. A book that I absolutely loved, and as I mentioned early on in the podcast, was one of those books my dad read to me and really embellished. So um, <laughs> so Cloudy with a Chance of Meatball 2 comes out, and I'm like, you know, I kind of hate crossovers, and I hate... I, I can't believe I'm saying this, for me, like, remember what I was talking about when it comes to, like, limitations and knowing what you can and can't do? Mm-hmm. And the whole idea of the review reverse was everybody was, you know, crossing over with everybody else, and then there was a crossover within a crossover within a crossover within a crossover, <laughs> you know, crossover section. What about the damn review for uh, for the movie you're talking about, dummy? <laughs> Who cares about all these, all these sub-stories? I just want to know what you think about, uh, you know, Happy Feet. <laughs> I don't care that there's a big space battle in space or whatnot. And exactly. I, and like you know, kind of another side point, but I feel like it kind of it drives home with what I what I mean is you know I was invited to do a movie on at Magfest, and the movie was um, Zenith. He did this movie um, called you know Those Who Fight, and I think it just turned into a short film. It was a decent short film, but he wanted me in it. And he asked me, if you have a role in this, uh, who do you, whose side do you want to fight on? And I said, um, I'm going to be my character, right? I'm going to be, you know, when I'm doing my review series, I'm going to be who I am. You know, he's like, nah, yeah, you are, but you're going to be, uh, you're going to be fighting in this big battle. And I'm like, why would I be fighting in a big battle? <laughs> like, it didn't make sense to me. Uh, like when he tried to describe the whole scene, I was like, but I wouldn't do that. If anything... I would be the guy who's getting coffee and is seeing this and is thinking, huh, that's going on, and then just move on with my day. <laughs> I'm not I, – I wasn't the kind of guy that does all these, these big uh, fantastical stuffs. And like, the, like I mentioned, the, the crossover with DJ Soundbite, that was trying to get me into it. But the best thing about working with him is that he was a – he's a good he, – he wants to get what he wants across – but he also knew where to meet me at. And when he let me do this crossover with him, he let me just uh, write the review I wanted to make about a song I really like. And just as long as it meets certain requirements, kind of like what they do with the MCU. It's like you have a movie, as long as you can connect it to the overall arc and whatnot, you'll be fine. Right. Um, just make sure you hit all these points. And that's basically all I had to do, except for one thing. I took out the word review averse <laughs> in the script. I was like, we're not sticking with that. Uh, it's just going to be a video where I'm in it, and, you know, it turned out really well. Anyways, when it comes to crossing over and when it comes to appearances and whatnot, there has to be a reason, and it has to, there has to be a reason why it looks like a certain way. And even though I'm looking out in front of me to talk to another person, I feel like it had to build up to a payoff. I was getting to know Matt really well, and I figured at some point we were going to meet, we were going to hang out. So I figured, you know, it was only inevitable for it to happen. And he was really down for doing the Cuddy with a Chance Meatballs uh, crossover. And I feel like it really paid off because a lot of people were expecting me to talk to him about it because they were messaging me about it. It's like, well, did you see his video? Do you see what he thinks about Sony Pictures? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I know that. And we talk about it. And that's why I think it was a great way for us to work together and sort of collaborate i feel like that's <clears throat> we kind of just met met each other where we're at which is why i think the cloudy with a chance of meatball 2 video turned out really well which then led to hotel transylvania which i gave him an appearance because i want if i'm gonna introduce a gun in the first act at least show it going off by the third so if i'm gonna be talking about another sony pictures animation wait you did that and you brought in this guy well you you still have this guy you can't just ignore him so i was like matt can you film a cameo for me for this Hotel Transylvania video? Sure, <clears throat> I will. And uh, just to add a little bit of continuity. Not too much continuity where it'll you know, throw people off. You know, like you watch a Linkara video and you find out you're like five storylines deep into something that you had no, no idea about. So like I uh, basically just um, try to make it so that it wasn't too confusing for, say, a new viewer watching this thing. So like... 
And then that's what led to the final crossover in Montreal, where I was, um, as I mentioned before, I'm getting my master's in counseling, and I was a part of the uh, uh, counselors associations, and their conference was in Montreal. I was like, dude, I know who else lives there. Let me, uh, let me give him a quick call and see if we can finish this off. We hung out. We, uh, showed me, he told me about poutine for the first time, which I thought was awesome. I was like, let's finish this. And the way we did it um, was very casual. Like, we had limitations, like I mentioned before. I feel like the limitations is an important thing to be aware of when you're going into filmmaking, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But um, we knew what our limitations were, and uh, we, made, we made the video. And I feel like the way it turned out was really cool, because I wanted it to be in the style of uh, animation, of animatch reviews, whereas it wasn't too much on-screen stuff. So that, you know, and it focused on the, the specific categories, but it at least incorporated my thoughts on it as well mm-hmm. as his. And, you know, we kind of just met, met each other. Like I say this a dozen times, we just we just met each other where we were at. Yep. So it wasn't like any any anything bad between us. We we're still really good. <laughs> if anything, I'm always I'm always asking him certain questions about, you know, how how to make certain videos and whatnot for advice here and there. Really great guy. Really, really, oh. really, really, really great guy. Uh huh. Indeed. Matt Brunet, God bless that guy. God bless him. God, <sighs> God bless Canada. God bless Canada. But please, please give them another chance. Please give SPA a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Just not this year with the Emoji Movie. Just uh, maybe next year. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> I know. Wishful uh, thinking. Uh, wishful thinking, indeed. So, is there any crossovers? that you would want to do with anybody like i know you're more accepting of it now so what crossover would you want to do it with somebody at some point you know it's funny too i'm more open to crossovers now because even though like i was i didn't know how to part of my hatred for it was because i really didn't know how to pull it off right but now that i kind of figure out how i can without it seeming forced um right now i would be very open to um just having discussions with people that that disagree with me honestly uh, and i feel like that in itself is a better a better crux than just two people who agree on the same thing it's true and um if i were to do crossovers again i mean there were a lot of things i had to learn um i don't know if you know this but um i've had a couple crossovers where i wasn't happy with the way it turned out but it wasn't on my channel so i didn't worry about it right and for me the biggest uh difference i had was um was a uh, page master with Huey two more and people love that video you know, oh. people did. People did enjoy that video, but truth be told, um, he asked me if I wanted to crossover with him, and I said sure. Um, what what movies are you reviewing? He said, Well, I'm, I am going to be reviewing Page Master. I said, Okay. Um, I don't. I liked that movie as a kid, but growing up, it had problems. It had some things wrong with it. He disagreed with me. He persistently disagreed with me on it, <laughs> and I was just like, Okay. Um, I would roll with the punches, but because I'm doing a crossover with you, I have to give my opinion here. So I can't censor myself. So that, you know, the writing process became a little bit slower, but like there was a lot of uh, back and forth between getting some things done that, you know, at some point you got to take, take the bullet sometimes. Like if, if someone is good, if it's his video, I, I had to respect certain things. So I had to respect, you know, certain boundaries that he, he put up. But, like, at some point, you know, you stand up for certain things that you believe in. Like, for example, he has a no-cursing policy thing on his show. Mm. So uh, I don't either. But I thought it would be funny because he had a, a moment where he talked about ebooks, And coming into a crossover is the biggest thing. How do you justify someone showing up on another screen without it seeming real? Like, hey, how you doing? Doing pretty good, you know? <clears throat> so... He had a line about ebooks, and I thought it would have been hilarious if I just showed up, cut, going on this big massive rant about ebooks, and I'm cursing and swearing like a sailor, <laughs> but it was all censored. You know, there was like a lot of censor bleeps going here and there, but that was the point. He didn't understand that there were censor bleeps at first, but I said it just would be so much funnier to have me just show up out of this like you know because. I'm going to be honest with you. Huey, two more videos can be very sweet and uh, kind of too, too sweet. Yeah. Like there's just sort of a sweetness and innocence to it, which is why people like Huey, two more. Mm-hmm. But like, I just thought having a little bit of brashness, especially because I'm this, I'm the New Yorker. 
I gotta come in <laughs> and be brash, and maybe just have Huey react to it. People loved it. I loved it. I was like, if I'm gonna write something, I gotta do something I like. I can't, I can't settle, and I think this would be very easy to do. It was, you know, he, he argued, he's like, I can't have cursing on my show. I was like, we'll censor it. A lot of bleeps. If anything, it'll be very funny when you're hearing all these bleeps and even see me doing hand gestures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's always funny with a bleep. I mean, God, geez, really? <laughs> exactly, but like, you know what? I had to meet him where he was at. I had to, there, was a, there was a lot of respect to you in there, but it was a lot of back and forth. Mm-hmm. It was probably the most back and forth I've ever had with a video. I mean, like I said, I'm kind of respecting because it's his video too, and I am showing up in his video, but right. it's a crossover where I got to give my opinion on certain things. I hate the movie. He likes it, so, you know. I had to, you know, at least justify for that. But if I ever wanted to do a crossover again, differences of opinions are welcome. But I yes. also want to encourage the other person to make it their own. I don't want to make it their own while sort of fitting what I'm doing. I don't want to have a situation where I'm forcing something on someone that they they don't like and they're not happy. And then suddenly it's like, if nobody's happy, what's the point? So I think there has to be a middle ground between it. Yeah. Whew. Yeah. Huey, Huey is just a mixed bag of nuts. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. He, oh, especially with Morgan, we definitely talked about the big controversy between them two and just uh, how complicated he's to work with and stuff like that. I think that was the uh, the, the the movie memory thing, mm-hmm. what was it, film fantasy movie something. Fantasy movie fantasy movie memories. Yeah, there was a lot of things going on. I wasn't really involved in that. The only no. time, though, that I wanted to be involved in it was when I talked about Hook. And I gave him my footage. And he hated it. <laughs> hated it. Oh, my God. But the sad thing about it, though, was that I kind of took it personally back then because I love Hook. Mm-hmm. But I also have an editing style. And I watched how his, the videos were done. But he he didn't accept it because he didn't like what I sent him. Jeez. Even though it was a movie that I absolutely loved and had, I feel like, I feel like I had something good to say. It was like, you know, we all have biases. We all have boundaries. Any, any, any video producer, any blogger, podcaster knows that you have boundaries and you have limits and you have, as long as you're aware of them, that's great. But sometimes when you're not, that can be, that can be an issue. Like if you don't know your own awareness like that can be that could be a problem and for me back then you know i was kind of new to it and i found out someone wasn't you know appreciative of that i kind of it kind of hurt me for a while you know yeah but i would i wouldn't have known it if i didn't try yeah it's always it's not hard it's it's okay to try try exactly just try it sometimes um so is when you do your videos is it just you or are you just doing a character of yourself no it's me basically the, the believe it or not the uh the brooklyn the brooklyn accent was and i'm very inconsistent with it too but believe it or not if you hear me talk long enough you'll notice that i have a certain slur to certain words and when i was filming myself for the first time i was doing it at the video station i uh, volunteered at and i put up the camera and someone asked me are you from brooklyn and i was like no i'm from Staten. I- you know I, I grew up in Staten island they're like, well, you have like a sort of thing with your gestures and your hands and, you know, your voice is that. So for the most part, when I'm doing my videos, I'm kind of doing them as myself. Mm-hmm. But I kind of embellish the Brooklyn here and there uh, for the sake for the sake of comedy. Okay. And But ideally, I try to keep it to myself. A little bit more embellishing on the Cartoon Palooza because I edit those videos more and I think more post goes into that. But there is a difference, a slight difference. But I think the best characters come out of uh, personal experience. Okay, okay, just just the curiosity things. I always hear the accent. I was like, wait, the, and I'm hearing you now, and I'm like, okay, you're not that exaggerated. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's like, wait, you're not like this in real life. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> so weird. Sorry. To... Took a dump in your cereal. <laughs> Ew, just eating that too, thanks. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> oh, man, yeah, yeah. So do you have any advice for anybody who wants to get into video making or even, like, critiquing anything? Oh, that is the million-dollar question, and, you know, I really had to meditate on this, and I really had to think about it, but um, 
if you're going to do it, do it because you want to do it. Do it because it's something you love. Like, if you love movies, do something out of it. Make a, make a reason out of it. If you love talking, make a career out of talking with people. Um, if you're creative, go into the creative arts. I mean, part of the reason why I chose counseling is because it kind of let me utilize all that. I work with people, and I meet them where they're at, but I'm also use it, utilizing my creativity, and I'm also utilizing myself personally to help other people go through pretty pretty tough shit. So, like, but in regards to filmmaking in general, if you're going to do it, do it because you want to do it, and it's going to seem so tempting to do what everybody else is doing. It's going to seem so tempting, man, because, like, if I was to do what everybody else is doing, I could easily just be... If I just wanted to do what Mr. Enter was doing or if I just wanted to do what Phantom Strider was doing, I could do that. But I, haven't, I, I can do it, but I don't choose to do it because that's not what I do. So, like... But that's okay to say, like, if you take influence from something and you see somebody, somebody else does that you really like and you want to try for yourself, you said it yourself perfectly. Give it a shot. Try it out. The worst thing that could happen is that some troll on the internet's gonna call you out for it, and own it up, choke it up, and just uh, do the next shot. Um, <laughs> sometimes when I make videos, and I mentioned, sometimes we get so self-conscious about what we make. Um, early on, you know, if I'm making videos and I hear people who are like, "I gotta remake this," or "I gotta like repost this video," or, you know, delete the last one I made, I'm like, I'm gonna take the Botchki, the Ralph Botchki approach. If if something in it seems off. I'm keeping it, and then if someone calls me out for it, they'll call me out for it, whatever. <laughs> Just as long as I'm going on to the next thing I want to make. You know, once I'm done making something, I don't want to dwell. Pass is past. Put it out. Work on the next thing. And, you know, that's kind of impacted what I'm doing right now, which goes to my final thing for anybody who wants to get into this. Scheduling. Limits. Know them. Because once you don't, it's going to bite you in the ass. The biggest problem I noticed was... I didn't balance my time out well. And I mean, a lot of it, and I'm going to be very vocal about it, a lot of it is because I was recently diagnosed with ADHD. Um, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it, was, it was hard for me because, like, growing up, it was kind of indicated that I may have inattention issues and that I may seem like I'm forgetting about something, but I'm easily just thinking about one topic after the next. And I had myself evaluated, and uh, I found myself getting the right needs. For it. I, I have the counseling, the medication necessary for that, and it helps me out because it lets me know what my limits are. So, like, when it comes to time management, I literally had to go on Google Calendars. I had to figure out the time it would take for me to edit a video. I had to figure out the time it would take for me to uh, to go and film it for one day in correlation to when I can hang out with friends, when I can hang out with family, um, you know, when I can, you know be myself and I feel like by knowing that it helps you out because when I didn't know that and I was making these videos everything was happening all at once and like I had to take really big breaks that I didn't want to take and then people were you know probably having a hard time figuring out like is he is he still active then why is he not making a video right now and it's like well I wish I could but like I just didn't manage my time properly but now that I feel like I am a little bit more conscious of that, it's helped, it's helped me out more. But then this goes back to my final thing. Four things. Um, doing something that because you love it, um, knowing your limits, taking influence. But the last thing you want to really drive through is that if you got to say no, just say no. If somebody wants you to review something that you have no desire in doing, just say no. If somebody wants you to jump into like this big epic space battle between guys in a hotel for a convention and you just feel like it doesn't apply to you, just say no. If, uh, <laughs> if, you, um, if you feel like you're doing something that doesn't justify what you love and doesn't really benefit you in any way, feel free to explain why. Or even keep it simple. Just say, I, I don't think I can do that. Uh, don't, don't dwell on it so much, but if you know... It's something you just can't do. You can't do it. And all those four things I feel like really apply to what you need to do if, if you want to succeed in this. Not even succeed. If you want to 
have fun doing this. If you want to have fun and, and make a nice penny out of it too. Being, you know, a lot of it is doing what you love, taking influence from the people that you, you really think are doing something good, but not to a point where you're kind of just taking what they're doing verbatim. Um, also knowing what your limits are and, and finally just, if you got to say no, say no. That is perfect. Thank pitch, you. Pitch perfect. Words to Thanks, live man. by. <sighs> you know, if, you know it, it's words to live by because sometimes we forget. Yeah. It's, and we lose track of that sometimes. But, like, sometimes with a little bit of reflection, it's like, I can do this. And there's a reason why I'm doing this. And it took me a while because, like, I recently had that slump. You know, stuff going on in life and whatnot. And I kind of, like, had to really reflect on that. Yeah. That's really good. Um, Thanks, man. There's, there's it's a little sidetracked here. What is your favorite Disney character? Oh, <laughs> thank you for asking, man. Thank you for asking. Like, um, I've said it before. My favorite cartoon character is Mickey Mouse. But if I, yeah, Mickey Mouse is my favorite because I feel like he embodies, early on, he embodied the everyman. He was a very influential character. I mean, you think of Disney, you think of the mouse. So I kind of like really love Mickey as a character, not even just as a character, but just as a movement kind of a movement though it's what the medium would go into and how it would define you know culture so for me it really just comes down to mickey mouse well i could be your opposite then because i like donald duck oh man don't worry about it man donald duck he's like my number two to be honest with you he's my number two mostly because donald duck is is daffy in that world mm -hmm. he's the short fuse but, you know, you understand why he's a short fuse. And when I'm working with kids, he's a great thing. It's great to show kids the, sh the, the Donald Duck shorts because what's causing him between his anger and his reaction? What caused, where's the line with him processing? And it's great to illustrate that for kids. And he also had a really great video game. Donald Duck Going Quackers is friggin' awesome. Oh, yeah. Which I'm probably going to be reviewing at some point. Of course. My first video game review. <laughs> That's Donald Duck going quackers on the PlayStation One, but uh, he also had some great comics too. Can't deny him that. Yeah, yeah, really good stuff. So like I said, Donald Duck is a great character, but for me, it's Mickey all the way. Well, the only reason why I like Donald a little bit more because I can do a impression of him very well. <laughs> <laughs> and I can do a great Mickey, so we could have a back and forth. Maybe we finish this video off in our in uh, Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck voices. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hilarious. Okay, so do you have any, like, upcoming videos you're working on, just to tease the audience a little bit? What are you working on right now? Anything worth mentioning? Well, I have. Okay, we're not doing that. Okay. No, no we're not. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if you remember this or if you watched my videos long enough, but the first two or three years, I used to have a retrospective of Batman animated movies that I would call the Batman Chronicles. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. So I'm actually going to bring that back Ooh. this year, right after I do my month of love. The uh, last video I did was a Brave Little Toaster, which right. is going to segue into an editorial on, um, on my thoughts on, on Cartoon Network, which aren't as negative as the Internet's making it out to be. But, you know, when that video comes, it comes. But then next month, I'm going to do uh, the Batman Chronicles. And then, I mean, in general, I'm trying to give every month a theme because it kind of gives me something to work off of every week. Mm -hmm. Not like a not like a really strong theme, but I've noticed that when I'm going from a review of Over the Garden Wall right after I did a review of Box Trolls, what's the connection, you know? Exactly. I try to at least make somewhat of a bridge so that it isn't too overwhelming for people just jumping in. It could be like, okay, he did that. I'll probably watch the last video. And the last video is like only six or eight minutes long. I could, I could do that too. You know, being very conscious of, like, what the viewer is, but at the same time, conscious for me. It's like, if I'm doing this, I got to justify it, right? Yeah. So, like, you know, Batman Chronicles is coming back. Um, that's, as far as, you know, Cartoon Palooza stuff goes, that's that's where I am right now. Um, as far as other projects I'm doing, like I said, the big project is uh, graduating with my master's. I mean, oh. I'm already practicing in my, I'm already practicing counselor, but... You know, once I get my license, I got my license, and I can do what I love. There you go. Um, and the best thing about it, too, is I also incorporate movie um, bibliotherapy, where I, I recommend movies to clients to watch, oh. and they process the movies. Um, if you ever, you know, any counselors out there, if you want to get, you know, billed by the insurance companies for an actual 
uh, therapy, bibliotherapy with a, you know, a focus on uh, on movies and and drama therapy, you can bill for it. That is pretty cool. Totally. But along those same ways, after I get my master's, um, I also have an animated short here and there I kind of work on. There's not a uh, I'm not really expecting you just to get it out for the sake of getting out. Like, right. here are YouTube videos, like my vlogs. Like, if I got to put a, vi- a vlog out on Monday, I'll put that out. But this is kind of like a project that I'm probably never going to finish, but I still like doing it. It's an animated short <clears throat> based on uh, a therapeutic oh. practice towards anger management. Ah. But I will give one hint. It takes the idea of people being short fuses. Okay. Okay. So... <sighs> Actually, here's a here's a question I've been thinking about. So once you get your 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 license and you start doing your thing, your job, are you still gonna make videos on the side? Still, or are you just gonna focus on your career more than anything else? No, absolutely. I could still do the videos. If anything, um, you know, as long as it doesn't like cross any ethical boundaries, I could still do it. And I like I said, the the videos have never really been my full time thing, but it's been. It's been substantial enough in my in my schedule for me to pursue without it getting in the way of my masters. It took me a while to figure that out, but um, through experience, obviously, I, I really never see myself stopping the videos. Maybe slowing down on the videos I put out because right now I'm at a pace. I'm putting out three videos a week. Yeah. Like, if I if I had to, like if I really did have to focus a little bit more on my job, I can go down to to one video a week, and it shouldn't be that much of a problem. I just noticed myself at a better at a better groove where I am right now, and I am kind of doing it full time. The fact that I am able to do that while doing it full time is is kind of good. It's kind of neat. That is really cool. All right. Uh, any final words before we uh, before I end this off? You know, and uh, it's weird because I feel like it's something that just kind of comes up over and over again. But like, I really think you know before we all forget it, um, the idea in believing yourself and actually what it means because. Uh, we grow up, we see all those dumbass movies that tell the big characters to believe in yourself. Yeah, you know, as long as you believe in yourself, everything is gonna be fine. Okay, when you're five years old or seven years old, do you think kids really know what believing in themselves actually is or being themselves actually is? I don't think kids really even know that yet. I feel like that's more of a message adults need to pick up, more so than the actual kids. But ideally, you know, when we when we're doing what we do and we do what we love we honestly have to look back in the things that we appreciate and the things that we love and to actually pursue it. And it's going to take you a really long time. Sometimes there are people that will never figure out. I know too many people that will never figure out, figure that out, but you only hope they can. So as long as you know who you are, just do it. <laughs> and that's all I got to say. But I really do hate that. <laughs> I really do hate that those kids' movies have to, have to plug that in. Without yeah. making any sense. Yeah, those thank kids. You, thank you, thank you. Those kids movies, I tell you. Um, so that is it for cinema talk. Thank you, Joey, for coming on and talking with me. You're such a great sport. It was a pleasure, man. So remember. <laughs> I'm gonna fire him. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> You're gonna be hearing from the court soon. You uh, talk out of curfew. <laughs> Say that to my lawyers. <laughs> I, got, I got the the Beaver Brothers. Or, oh, Jonas Brothers. Uh-huh. I don't even know who the Beaver Brothers are. <laughs> I've played this off long enough. <laughs> God damn it. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes. Oh, just check out Joey. Just go go to his YouTube channel, subscribe to him, like his videos, comment, watch his videos, go on his social media, t- chat with him, you know. Go, do you have a Patreon, actually? <laughs> I do actually have a Patreon, that... but I'm going to be honest with you. My Patreon game sucks. Uh... So, like, I've, been, I've been recently trying and trying and trying, but the big incentive to uh, get people to donate is the review. So there I actually go. have it for $10 uh, pledge if you want me to review a movie of your choice. The thing is, is that I I basically figured out ten dollars because I have to I buy the movie, you know, when I am reviewing it. So when you donate, I pretty much goes back to watching it. So that's the reason why that pledge is that much. That's... But you can donate a dollar, five dollars, two dollars if you want. And I mean, if you have something you're thinking about doing, but you know you're having a hard time 
figuring out. I, I can meet you where you're at. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, just support him, man, because he needs the support. Thanks, man. I really appreciate that. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Exactly. Oh, I kind of wish I got a chance to talk about Finding Dory, because I kind of related to that, too. <laughs> really? What about Finding Dory made you feel that I way? Mean, well, yeah, I mean... We all know the, the actual uh, short-term memory loss thing right. is, is played up at times. Mm -hmm. But the movie had a really good message where she knows she has a problem, but that's not keeping her from doing something that she wants. And there is a journey to it that I think that most people who are told, you know, you, you have oppositional defiant disorder, you have, um, you know, you are on the spectrum or you are... Uh, this, this, and this, you know, this is going to keep you from doing that, that, that. I think it's very empowering to say, to have the, the counter to that, you know? And I think a lot more kids should be exposed to that. And even adults. Yeah, okay. I see that. I can see that. Yeah, because, uh, kind of got a real personal with you. Um, I have Asperger's syndrome. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm on the spectrum, per se, and it's kind of cool how I met with James, Matt, and Morgan, because, well, not Matt, per se, but James and Morgan have are on the autism spectrum as well, so it was like, yeah. it was kind of a miracle, like, wow, I'm not the only one who has autism, so we talk about yeah. movies together, it was pretty cool. Matt has something similar to that on the line, but that was kind of mm -hmm. cool how we come together as people with sort of, like, mental disabilities and talk about, you know, stuff we love. No, and I think this is the best age to do it because, um, you know, it's 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 not just about saying, you know, feel bad for somebody. It's very much saying you can do what you want, you know, because I think that's been the problem. It's like, no, 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 it'll be no. It's like do what you want to do without people having to judge you or, you, you know, if people do at least just, you know, take it for what it is and, and, and move on. And I mean, it it's great work because like. I wasn't diagnosed uh, with with a Asperger's or autism spectrum disorder per se, but it relates to what I do because my my population uh, in general, I work with kids and teenagers, but my focus I want to make for working with kids who have higher functioning autism or Asperger's because I feel like there's a need there that's not being met with behaviorists. Generally, I think there is a clinical like a con there is like a therapeutic way that counselors can can work with the clients that isn't being utilized and i feel like that's that's kind of like where i want to be that that's really cool man you do what you need to do man you okay there yeah i was getting emotional for a second i'm sorry about that oh man it was just a beautiful cry <laughs> you're just you're, you're just such an awesome dude Man. Wow. Thanks, man.